All right, I'm going to make sure we, our live stream is going, then we'll get started. Hey, y'all, did y'all have a good day? Yeah. Good? It's good. Okay, yes. It's working. It's good. Although I'll say my, my mic is a little too loud. Let me adjust that. How about now? I'm going to run with that. All right, so uh, good evening. Welcome back. If this is your first uh, time with us in this series, there's a few of you. Um, we've been working our way through the series we're calling uh, A Cloud of Witnesses, which basically the idea is that we aren't the first Christians who ever lived. And I'm really grateful for that. Uh, there are lots of faithful men and women stretching back 2,000 years who have loved the Lord and who have been faithful in their own time. And the author of the letter to the Hebrews says they now are a great cloud of witnesses who are seated in heaven watching us. We kind of use the metaphor. They're like cheering us on as we run our race in our time. And so we've worked our way from the time of the apostles all the way now we're in the 16th century tonight. And uh, we've been asking two major questions. One, if these people were faithful in their generation, what convictions did they have that we should continue clinging to today? They had some convictions that were important for them then, and they're important for us now. What are those convictions? And the second question is, how can we look at their example and then emulate them? How can we learn from what they've done and apply it to our lives? And you know, we haven't really run out of things to talk about, which is amazing. You know, we've talked about martyrs and defenders of the faith. We've talked about monks and scholars, and uh, it's really been kind of cool. Have y'all enjoyed it? Those of you who've been here and been watching online, it's been good. Cool. There's a few people straggling in, so we should pray for them uh, or something. <laughs> But we do need to start with prayer. Y'all come across anything today that kind of blew your mind? Oh, yeah, the Israel thing is terrible, isn't it? It's what a mess. Yeah. What did you say their name? Just Aaron's friend. Okay, just Aaron's friend. Okay, cool. All right, well then let's, let's start with prayer and then we're going to jump right in. I got a question I need to ask you. Then we'll go. Father in heaven, thank you so much for tonight and for this church. Uh, thank you for these people and a chance to uh, open up your word and think about your people through the centuries. God, we thank you that we aren't the first Christians. Uh, we're having a hard enough time as it is, uh, but thank you for giving us examples of godly people who have lived in much worse times than we're living through. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to find something good in them, uh, that we learn from the examples and uh, hold to their convictions. God, we pray for Aaron's friend tonight. Lord, you know all that his friend is going through, whatever difficulties they're facing. You're right there with him. I pray that you'd strengthen him for it and you'd give him peace through it. And God, we do pray uh, for the turmoil tonight uh, all around the world. God, people facing uncertain economies and uh, nations under threat of cyber attacks and hackers and missiles and all that. God, you know our world is a mess. Uh, Lord, bring peace and uh, help us to remain faithful to you no matter what comes our way. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so here's the question. Have you ever been in a really dicey situation and made a bargain with God every day. Okay. You get into a situation a little bit dicey, a little bit uncertain, a little bit concerned, a little bit worried, and you say, God, if you get me out of this, I promise I'll go to church every Sunday. You know? Have you have y'all ever done anything like that? You made a bargain with God? Okay. So this is something we're familiar with. Anybody want to share your bargain? No? Okay. <laughs> Embarrassing. Well, tonight we're going to be talking about a man that we know about because he made one of these bargains. 
man is Martin Luther. And if he hadn't made this bargain with God, we wouldn't be talking about him, and we wouldn't be sitting here in Central Baptist Church. Um, but he did make a bargain on July 2nd in 1505. Long, long time ago. Martin Luther was born in 1483 in, a, uh, in the Holy Roman Empire, a town called Eisleben, which is now in Germany. His father was a businessman. He owned copper mines and a smelting operation. And he wanted his son to have good things in life. So he paid for him to go to Latin schools and to have the best education money could buy because he wanted his son, Martin, to be a lawyer. And so he'd send his son off to really the Harvard of the day, a town called Erfurt, which had a university. And he got his bachelor's degree, his master's degree, and he was beginning to study law. But one night, he was on his way home, and he got caught in a thunderstorm, like last night's thunderstorm. All right, and he's in the woods, and he's totally frightened, scared out of his mind. And you'd understand why. I mean, Martin Luther is a man born and at home in the Middle Ages. And we've talked about the Middle Ages for the past couple of weeks. But the Middle Ages might as well have been a different planet than the one you and I live on. I mean, they believed in goblins. Y'all believe in goblins? No. Ghouls? You don't believe that ghosts of your dead ancestors come out once a year? I and mean, that's not your world. But it was Martin Luther's world. He believed in goblins and ghouls. And when a lightning bolt struck near him in this thunderstorm, he received it as a definite omen and sign from God. He thought God had thrown a thunderbolt to try to hit him. You know, we would call it happenstance, coincidence, or chance. But he believed that God had just about killed him to get his attention. That he had made the wrong choices in life, and he was headed down the wrong path. And so he swore to God, right there on the spot, if you save me from this thing, I'll become a monk. And so he made it out of the forest, back to his home, and that's what he did. He entered into an Augustinian monastery in 1505, and he excelled in his studies. He excelled so much that they eventually decided that he would be better served if he went off to the town of Wittenberg. You know, in Germany they call it Wittenberg. Wittenberg to study theology. And so he began to grow in his understanding. He began to read the sources that we've talked about, the scholastics. Uh, maybe I mentioned Peter Abelard's Sentences, which was the standard textbook of scholastic theology. He wrote a commentary on it, uh, received a bachelor degree based on his work in it, and w became a, a teacher of theology. He became so well versed in the theological issues of his day that in 1510, the Augustinian monasteries elected him to be sent to Rome to represent the Augustinian monks before the Pope. And while he was in Rome in 1510 and 1511, he got to see firsthand the construction of St. Peter's Basilica. Uh, it had been severely damaged, and the Pope was under an incredible project to make it what we know it is today. And uh, so he got to see it with his own eyes. Got to see what the church was all about, up close and personal. And uh, it wasn't all good. Right? Some of that stuff we talked about last week in what made the Middle Ages sometimes called the Dark Ages, the Dark Ages. And we talked about corruption, uh, the practice of concubinage for the priests who were supposed to be committed to a celibate life. Uh, we saw the, the luxury of the clergy. And uh, this little guy from Germany was sort of disgusted by the whole thing. So he went back to Wittenberg and in 1512 got his PhD, his doctorate in theology, and in 1513 was made the professor of theology at the University of Wittenberg. And then he did something that probably changes the horse, course of history. He picked up his Bible and he starts teaching through the book of Romans and then the book of Galatians. And it changed his life, and it changed the world. We're going to run through his biography, and then we're going to pull out some facets of his theology. So let's just keep running. All right, in 1516, 
just a few years after he's been pre uh, teaching through the Bible, um, Pope Leo X sent a representative named Johann Tetzel, who was a Dominican friar, we talked about them a couple of weeks ago too, uh, into the German provinces to begin collecting indulgences, which we talked about last week, right? Those things you might purchase that would allow you to pay for your sins quicker. And Johann Tetzel had a phrase that he would say, as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. And so this was his message. He went around selling indulgences in large part to fund the construction of St. Peter's Basilica that Martin Luther had seen just a few years earlier. And Martin Luther became completely disgusted by this whole practice. Uh, he'd been preaching through Romans, teaching through Romans, and so he'd start to get a real grasp of the Apostle Paul's theology of how a person gets saved. And he saw a, a real distinction between the way of salvation being preached by Tetzel and the one being preached by Paul. And so in 1517, on October 31st, he nailed what we know as the 95 Theses to the church door in Wittenberg, which was like the, the, bull, the bulletin board for the community. You'd, you'd nail your notices there because everybody goes to church and everybody would see it. And so he nailed these 95 theses, which the real title is The Disputation on the Power and, Efe and Efficacy of Indulgences. And he thought that he'd put these 95 points of argumentation up and somebody from the university community would take up his offer to have a public debate about the usefulness of indulgences. At this point, Luther believes that the Pope has no concept of what's going on, that Tetzel's acting on his own authority, and uh, if the Pope only knew what was happening, then he would set things to right. But pretty quickly, he realizes that's not the case. In 1518, the Pope denounces him and calls for him to recant. Luther's brought to the place of Heidelberg, where uh, he participates in the Heidelberg Disputation, Fellow Augustinian monks say, Luther, you've really gone off the rails here, man. You're speaking against the church. You need to correct your theology. And he says no. Uh, he also finds himself uh, meeting with a cardinal in Augsburg in 1518 who does the same thing, tries to bring him to a recant, and he doesn't. Finally, in 1520, Pope Leo X issues an official church declaration called a bull, a papal bull, called Exerge Domine which is the Latin for Arise, O Lord. And it's a militant refutation of Martin Luther. It calls him a heretic and gives him 60 days to recant or face excommunication. And uh, Martin Luther took the papal bull, Exerge Domine, and burned it. Yeah. And then he went about the work of writing three books. Uh, you can find them for free online. One's called The Freedom of a Christian, the other on the Babylonian Captivity of the Church, and the third, A Letter to the Christian Nobility of Germany. And he essentially went to war with the church. This whole war comes to a head in 1521 at the Imperial Diet in a city called Worms, and the scene is like made for movies because the newly elected emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, Charles, the, Charles V, is there, and he's got delegates from every electoral province in the empire, people from every monastic community, religious authority, and they're all there for a public trial for this guy who is sowing discord in the empire and in the church. And so they have him here on the stand, and the emperor has a man read out the titles of 25 books that Luther had written in a period of about four years. And he says, Martin Luther, are you the author of these books? And he says, yeah, as best I can remember, I'm the guy who wrote those. They're like, okay. Well, do you publicly recant of the errors contained in them? And he said, can I have 24 hours to think things over? And so he takes 24 hours. He goes to his room, and he prays. And he asks his friends, what do you guys think I should do? Should I, am I in the wrong here? Should I recant? Have I missed it completely? 
24 hours is up and he's brought back in and the suspense, you know, is palpable. Everybody's there ready to hear. And he said, listen, as to these 25 books and the errors that they contain, he said, as best as I can tell, there are three types of books here. There are the devotional books that I wrote for ordinary Christian people. And even my enemies find them useful. So it would be wrong for me to recant for those. So that then there are works that he called works that attack ecclesiastical abuses. He said those abuses are clearly wrong. And if I recanted of those works, then I would only be supporting and encouraging tyranny and error. And then there are a third group of works, works that named names, called people out, that were maybe a little harsh in their approach. And he said, while I may regret some of the wording, I still believe those men are wrong. And so he says, and I put it in your page here, unless I'm convinced by sacred scripture or by evident reason, I cannot recant, for my conscience is held captive by the word of God, and to act against conscience is neither safe nor right. And so he refuses to recant. Charles V wants to avoid a political, you know, uh, crisis, and so he lets him leave rather than kill him on the spot, as they'd done with Jan Hus a, decade, uh, a century before. And as Luther's headed home, he thinks, you know, it's over. All my work is going to come to nothing. Eventually, they're going to find me and they're going to execute me. But the prince of Electoral Saxony, where Luther lived, a man named Frederick the Wise, had some of his soldiers disguised as highwaymen, and they kidnapped him and took him to a castle and locked him away for a year. And there he translated the New Testament, wrote a bunch of books, and thought this was going to be it. This was his life's work. He's going to leave behind this. But when he came out of the castle after a year, he realized that something had happened. The Reformation, which he didn't call it that, but this little movement that he had started was out of the bag. Nobody could undo it. That from the peasants to the nobility, people had bought in to the message that he preached, and there was no stopping it. And so what was the message? What, what on earth could some little monk in Germany at the end of the Middle Ages have done to create the world we know. And I got a few things I want to point out to you. The first is the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith alone. Salvation by grace through faith alone. And I told you one of the big things that happened for Luther was that after he becomes professor of theology, he starts teaching through the books of Romans and Galatians. Have you all ever read Romans? You ever read Galatians? Yeah, there's some pretty good stuff in there. But Luther found it challenging. If you want to open your Bible, you can turn with me to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. So you can maybe imagine a monk in his robes teaching through this in a dusty theology class, and he gets to verses 16 and 17. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it's written, the righteous man shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And during the Middle Ages, they had a pretty standard way of interpreting this passage. We've, we've looked at it. This great tradition that had passed down from generation of the church to the next generation included well-worn interpretations of the most essential passages. Luther's job was not to innovate, but to preserve what he had received from the generations that had come before. And what he had received on Romans 1.17 is terrifying. 
The righteousness of God. What is the righteousness of God? What do you all think? Righteousness of God. Does your Bible say something different? Luther would have been teaching from the church's official translation of the Greek New Testament called the Vulgate, translated by St. Jerome. So the righteousness of God would have been what he was working from. And the righteousness of God in his theology, as he had received it, said this, that God is righteous, that means he always does what is right, and since God is holy and can't countenance human sin, he's right to punish sin. The righteousness of God in Romans 1.17 is God's righteous judgment of sinners. And that's a terrifying thing. Because, yeah, what were you saying? I'm going to say something MacArthur said it should better be translated righteousness from God. Yeah. So Luther's thinking, okay, th this righteousness right here is God's just punishment of sinners. And so he says, this is from his account of his thinking on this passage. He said, as a monk, I led an irreproachable life. Nevertheless, I felt that I was a sinner before God. My conscience was restless, and I could not depend on God being propitiated by my satisfactions. What he means is, I couldn't depend on my goodness, even as a monk with an irreproachable life, to get me out from under God's righteous judgment of sinners like me. Not only did I not love, but I actually hated the righteous God who punishes sinners. I hated God because here I am trying to live a good life doing, I'm jumping through all the hoops. We talked about some of these hoops last week. How do you get grace? Well, he's a monk. He's got one of the sacraments that you and I don't. He's got the sacrament of holy orders. He is going all out to receive salvation and still he feels totally and morally, spiritually bankrupt before God. So you can imagine, what more do you want from me, God? I'm doing everything you've asked and still I have this conscience within me that consistently convicts me that I'm a sinner. Nothing I do is good enough. I'm under your judgment and condemnation. But then he says, finally God had mercy on me. And I began to understand that the righteousness of God is a gift of God by which a righteous man lives, namely faith. And that sentence, the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel, is passive indicating that the merciful God justifies us by faith. As it's written, the righteous shall live by faith. Now I felt as though I had been reborn altogether and had entered paradise. The deal is this. The righteousness of God is not something that can be earned or attained by a sinless life, a life of complete obedience. Rather, the righteousness of God that you and I need, that He needed, is a gift to be received by a person who trusts completely in the gospel. That Jesus Christ, the Son of God, took on human flesh and lived a sinless life to die on the cross in the place of sinners like me. He died in my place so that I could receive His righteousness. That's what Luther came to understand. That's what transformed his own life. That there's nothing that I can do or that he could do or that you can do to earn your salvation you can't, contribute it to, you can't contribute to it in any way. It's a gift that must be received by faith. And Luther had a great phrase for this. He called it the great exchange. The great exchange. What, what exchange is it except my sin for Christ's righteousness and Christ's righteousness for my sin? It's what Paul talks about in Romans 4. Turn over to Romans 4. Romans 4, verse 5. To the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. 
credited as righteousness. R righteousness is a real thing. It's an objective standard. There is such a thing, and we know this, I mean, we live in a broken world. We can all see the difference between righteousness and wickedness. Everybody with two eyes knows when something's right or wrong. Not only that, God puts it within us that we have an innate sense of right and wrong. But what happens when you take the whole scope of a person's life into account? Their thoughts, their speech, their behavior, and it consistently comes up short. They're objectively wicked. But Luther says, in God's economy, by grace, our wickedness is exchanged for Christ's righteousness. That it's credited to us as if his righteousness was ours and as if our sin was his. It's, we, we also talk about it as the doctrine of imputation. An exchange takes place. And it happens by faith. Look over at 2 Corinthians 5. Verse 21. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. This is one of those good verses that's maybe worth memorizing writing on your mirror so you have to see it every day. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So Luther comes to this realization that the whole Bible tells us that yes, we are sinners. That's an objective thing. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. If you're looking at yourself, and we're going to talk about looking at ourselves in a second. If you're looking at yourself, you are objectively wicked. You sin. Can I get an amen? I mean, you know you're a sinner, right? Okay, good, yes. If you don't know this, let me help you understand. Let your, let your spouse or your children let you know. We are objectively wicked. But God sees us in our wickedness and extends to us the grace and mercy of new life in Christ. And that he takes our wickedness and sin, places it on his righteous son, and takes the righteousness of his son and applies it to us. That's what Paul could say in 2 Corinthians 5.17, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. So, we experience this great exchange, our wickedness for Christ's righteousness. He has a great Latin phrase, called simul usus es peccator, which means at the same time both righteous and sinner. And the truth is, is that we have the, if, if you look at it from our perspective, we are a sinner, and we're intimately familiar with our sin. And yet from God's perspective in Christ, we are completely righteous. And that is a totally revolutionary idea in 15, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. That was not being talked about or taught by anybody else. Luther believes with all his heart, and you can think about what we've already talked about through our church history series, that he's consistent with the Bible and with the early church, but that there had been a separation from that tradition by the establishment. And so he thinks he's recovering it, but obviously from their perspective, they thought he was sowing seeds of disunity and spreading heresy in the church. So this is the first facet that turns this little Augustinian monk in Germany into a guy who changes the world. What do y'all think about that? Does that sound familiar to you? You've heard all that before. That's not groundbreaking. It's because you're a Protestant. You're, you're a Luther person. Okay, so the second thing, not just salvation by grace through faith alone, but Luther has this thing he calls the law gospel distinction. The law-gospel distinction. Well, you, it's on your page. The law-gospel distinction. And, and by this, he means that all of Scripture either operates in one of two ways. It either operates for us as law or as gospel. 
that God's Word either speaks to us in the indicative, telling us what has been done, or in the imperative, what must be done. And he breaks it out into the law and the gospel. And he says there are three uses of the law. This will make sense in just a second. There are three ways God's commands speak to us and are functioning in our world. The first is that God's word curbs, this is, this is good, curbs, curbs, you know, like a curb, Cur it curbs sin. God's word curbs sin. And by that he means that when we hear God's commands, like let's throw a command out there. Shall not kill. That God's command to not kill curbs sin in the world. You know that it's wrong to sin. It's wrong to kill. So you feel compelled not to do it. Right? It controls and curbs sin. Now, not for everyone, but as a general rule, we know that it's wrong to lie. And so we feel a little bit of guilt when we lie. Right? We, we know it's wrong to steal. And so maybe we tell our kids, hey, God wants you to tell the truth and not lie. God wants you to honor your parents. And it helps to curb sin. That's the first use of law. The second one, though, he says the law works as a mirror. Y'all ladies, y'all know about those mirrors. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But a mirror, God's law as a mirror, serves to show us ourselves and to convict us of sin. So you read the Bible one day in your quiet time, and you're just trying to get a little pumped up for your day, and then you read something that feels a little bit convicting. You shall not lie. And all of a sudden you realize, wait, I have lied. That, that's talking about me. I lie all the time. I'm not a very truthful person. And you feel convicted, as if you looked into a mirror and saw yourself for the very first time. That's the way God's law is meant to work. It's meant to prove to you that you really are wicked, to help you see yourself as you truly are from God's perspective. It's a mirror. James says that if anybody looks in the law, the perfect law of liberty, and yet goes away and does nothing about it. He's like the person who looks in the mirror in the morning and sees their hairs all out of whack and does nothing about it. It makes no sense. You can't help but go by a mirror. You can't help but walk by a window that has a reflection and say, hey, I'm, how am I looking? Do I look okay? Do I look well put together? And that's the way the Bible's supposed to work. We read God's Word, and it's supposed to show us something. The, the scary part is most of us read the Bible and it goes in, but it doesn't affect us in any way. It's like it just washes over us. We don't have any meaningful spiritual connection. It's not convicting us. It's not reproving us. We're not actually assessing ourselves against it like it's the straight edge that the whole course of our life is measured against. You all know what I'm talking about? But it's supposed to. It's supposed to serve as a mirror to accuse us and to show us our sin because it's trying to break us down. That's what God wants to do for you. He loves you enough that he wants to give you an accurate picture of who you really are from his perspective. If you don't know you're sinning, you can't repent of your sin. If you don't know you're sinning, you can't get right with God. And so his law functions to show us where we're wrong, where we've departed from his way, so that we can come to him. But lastly, the third use of the law is it serves to us as a guide. It shows us what God wants for our lives. So you go in the Bible and you're reading and you come across these imperatives where, I don't know, it says thou shalt not kill and it's working on you. It's not just a book like a novel. It's not the newspaper where you're getting some daily facts. It is the Word of God speaking to you to accomplish something. He's trying to curb sin in your life. He's trying to accuse you and show you what you're really all about from his perspective, and he's trying to guide you. That's the imperative. Do this. But then Luther talks about the gospel, and the gospel is totally opposed to do this. 
It's not about imperatives. The gospel doesn't tell us what we have to do. The gospel tells us what God has already done for us in Christ. It's the indicative. If anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. What does that tell you to do? You can't do anything to earn that. God has already done it. That is a fact. It's a statement like what I'm preaching this Sunday from the book of Titus. He says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, teaching us to renounce ungodliness and worldly desires and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. And what he does, Paul, using this law gospel distinction, you see it clearly, he says the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Gospel. God has done that. You don't have to do anything to earn God's love. We love because he first loved us. God loved the world and he sent his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's God acting on God's initiative, not doing anything to require something from you, but just his perfect grace overflowing from the perfect, good, beautiful, divine being loving us. That's gospel, what God has done. But, Paul says, teaching us to renounce ungodliness and worldly desires. That there is a response. You read that passage and you can't help but say, well, God did that for me. Have I responded to him in a life of obedience? Has the command to renounce an unga ungodliness, has that worked in me? Is it guiding me to know what he's really expecting of me? Has it shown me this morning as I'm preparing this text where I haven't renounced ungodliness and worldly desires? So the, God, the whole Bible breaks out into these two things. The law, which is meant to curb sin, show us our sin, or guide us into a righteous life, or the gospel, which tells us what God has already done for us. That's all there is. And if it's the law, you know what to do with it. And if it's the gospel, you know what to do with it. If it's the gospel, you believe. You exercise faith, and you say, Thank you, God. I don't understand why you would give your son for me, but I receive that by faith. I'm, I'm holding on to it, and I'm trusting it with my entire being. But if it's the law, you also understand. So, first, salvation by grace through faith. Second, the law gospel distinction. Third, the church. Luther's doctrine of the church is probably the thing that gets him the most flack then and now. You know, before Luther, before 1520, there is one holy Catholic church. Undivided. You got east and west. Okay, that's 1054. We talked about that. But you, in the west, you have one church. Every geographical region, every country and electorate is united under one figurehead, the pope, the bishop of Rome. There's one church. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church helped to preserve European unity. Everybody's of the same religion. They claim allegiance to the same figurehead. So you got an inbuilt sort of uniting thing. Afterwards, there are like a million denominations, a million churches. New ones are formed all the time. Uh, there's not unity in the world. Uh, after this happens, you have this thing, the Hundred Years' War. You know, it's not good. So the church changes everything. Luther's doctrine of the church changes. And this is how he puts it in the Augsburg Confession. This is developed by his followers, but is consistent with Luther's theology. The Augsburg Confession, Article 7, says, The church is the congregation of saints. You know, the, the Roman Catholic Church teaches that the church is the church. It's the organism represented as the pope. He is the vicar of Christ on earth. And that is the church. But Luther says, that's not right. The church is the people of God, the congregation of the saints, in which the gospel, and this is important, is rightly taught, and the sacraments are rightly administered. So he says, the true unity of the church is not enough to agree. Uh, in the true unity of the church, it's enough to agree concerning the doctrine of the gospel and the administration of the sacraments. Nor is it necessary that human traditions, rites, or ceremonies instituted by men should be everywhere alike. As Paul says, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, etc. Ephesians 4, 5, and 6. What they're saying is true Christian unity is not organizational or structural. Just because you belong to the Presbyterian Church or to the Baptist Church or to the Methodist Church, or any, take your pick, 
doesn't matter that you're of different denomination. What matters is that the gospel's present in those places. Uh, and it's not like they had religious diversity in Germany in the 16th century. They were all Lutherans. But still, we recognize that the doctrine is what unites us, not the organizational structure, that there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Whatever church you're in, if you believe in Jesus and have received him by faith, you're a Christian. That's unity. Then Luther goes beyond that, though, and he talks about seven characteristics of the church. And I like these more, because these are straight from Luther and not some confession. He says that the true church can be recognized by the word of God. And, and this is really radical. While uh, Luther was locked up in the castle, he translated the entire New Testament into vernacular German so that the common person, if they were able to read, and like people like Luther had gone to Latin schools, and so more and more people had the reading ability, they're able to read the Bible. And Luther said you can tell the church because the church is completely committed to God's word. You know, I'm, my conscience is bound by the word of God. Unless I can be convinced by the word of God and right reason, I'm not going to change my mind. That's Luther's personal conviction. I don't think we recognize in that something that really unites people of faith everywhere. That, yeah, you know, we want to be people of the book. We want to be committed to God's word, taking our cues from what he's put in that book. If it's not there, maybe it makes sense, and maybe it's good, but it's not on the same level as what's there. So a commitment to the word. He says also baptism. Baptism. You see the church because people have been baptized. There is a clearly definable Mark. Luther continued, and Lutherans continued calling them sacraments, even though their understanding of how grace was transmitted was totally different in the Catholic Church. They still practiced the infant baptism that Roman Catholics did. And Luther still said that baptism sets off the people of God. It's clearly identifiable. It's something that if the church ceases to practice baptism, they cease to be the church. He does the same with the Lord's Supper. And though the doctrine of transubstantiation um, which we didn't really talk about much. Did we talk about transubstantiation? Okay. But you know what that is. You right? Do you have a kind of concept of that? Transubstantiation is the doctrine uh, of the Lord's Supper that develops in the Middle Ages where they start to take the consecrated host, the bread, and the wine, and they believe that while it remains bread and wine, it's also transformed to be the body and blood of Christ. So that by partaking of the sacrament in the right way with the proper faith, you are partaking really of the body and blood of Christ. Okay, that's the Roman Catholic doctrine of the Lord's Supper, transubstantiation. Luther departs from that, and it gets messy. We don't we're talk about it tonight. Maybe we can talk about it next week. But this is one of the issues that starts to arise is that once you introduce any kind of different interpretation, you start to open it up to all interpretations. Luther didn't affirm transubstantiation, he affirmed consubstantiation. And he said it's not that the, the bread and the wine are the body and blood of Christ, but that the body and blood of Christ is present with the bread and wine, he says, above, under, and all around it. So figure that one out. I don't know. Um, anyway, so Luther departs from that, even though his understanding is different than my understanding, and we can talk about that maybe next week. Um, he says the Lord's Supper identifies the church as the church. Then he says church discipline identifies the church as the church. Uh, Luther had experienced church discipline. He'd been excommunicated, de-churched by the Pope, right? You're no longer a Christian. But he believed that the church went beyond his, I mean, the Pope went beyond his personal authority. He looked at Matthew 18, 16, and uh, he said Jesus' method for church discipline gives final authority not to one person, but to the church as the people of God. that They've been given the keys of the kingdom. And uh, he believed that the church ought to practice church discipline. And church discipline simply, the church reserving the right to maintain its own fences. You know, I've not, I've not always known about fences like I know about fences now. I've learned that maintaining fences is hard work. <laughs> it's dirty work. It's hot work. Uh, it's not easy. It's not fun but it's something you have to do. And he said church discipline is necessary, that the church ought to be able to maintain its boundaries, that the church reserves the right in every place to determine who's in and who's out. That's church discipline. And we don't practice it much anymore. It's in our bylaws. Matthew 18 is in our church bylaws. And 
it would be messy to start maintaining fences, but probably something that Luther would say we ought to do. How do you decide who's in and who's out? That's what Luther says defines the church. He also says it is defined by worship, that the church exists for the glory of God. And so when the church gathers, it gathers to worship him, to bring him glory and to bring him praise. He says the church is seen in its offices, not desks and shelves. But the church is seen in the fact that there are people set apart for particular tasks in the body, pastors and deacons. Right? The church is there. It's seen in them. But lastly, and this is probably most important for Luther, we're not going to talk about it, but you could do some Googling. Uh, he said the seventh characteristic of the church is suffering, that the church is bound to suffer because it follows a crucified Lord. And I'll write this down for you. Luther had a problem... with theologians of glory. And he said we ought to be theologians of the cross, not theologians of glory. By that he means that certain people, and he's talking about the established church, thought of the church as this ever-ascendant thing, that it was only going to get better and more and more glorious that the Christian life wasn't about suffering, it was about getting beyond all that into the eternal, heavenly life, even possible on earth. I think said, that's crazy. Everywhere you look through the history of the church, the church has suffered because they follow a crucified Lord. So we have to be people of the cross and not people of glory. So Google that and look into it. So the church, the law gospel distinction, and salvation by grace through faith, but this is the last one, and I think probably the one that's most meaningful to me. And it comes down to this idea of vocation. Not vacation. That would be nice. V vocation. Vocation comes from the Latin word vocare, which means to call. And Luther's doctrine of vocation is basically, and I love this, Luther's a monk. So he had experienced the sacrament of holy orders. And, and he believed with all his heart that he had entered into a deeper relationship with God than the ordinary peasants around him could. He had entered into the monastic order, had a different relationship with God, a deeper experience of grace than they did. And that was the way the medieval world was structured. I don't know if y'all remember, they taught us in school, so they might have taught y'all, they probably don't teach it anymore, but the golden chain of being. Y'all remember, anybody ever heard that? Okay, you've heard of it. So apparently the whole entire universe had been divided into different hierarchies of relationship to God. You have God, you have the angels, you have the Pope, you have the priests and monks, you have the princes, you have the common person, you have the demons, you have the devil, right? There's an order of being in the universe. And what Luther's doctrine of vocation did is totally obliterate that distinction. He said every person, whether they're a prince or a priest or a peasant, has been given a particular calling in life. And they're to use that calling to bring glory to God. And so I put you down this quote. He says, the Christian shoemaker does his duty not by putting little crosses on the shoes, but by making good shoes because God is interested in good craftsmanship. And that's Luther's doctrine of vocation in a nutshell. Doesn't matter, you don't, if you want to really serve God, you don't have to go into ministry. You just have to do whatever your hands finds to do with all your might and to do it as unto the Lord. That's the ministry of your vocation. So whether you're a mom or whether you're a business person or whether you're a retiree, God has put you in the position he's put you in to bring him honor and praise. And when you do the, your job to the best of your ability, and you excel by His grace, and you use your life as an example of what living out a godly life is all about, you bring Him praise, you bring Him honor. And so because of that, Luther starts to remove distinctions between people in his churches. And one of the first things he does is obliterate the man-made tradition of priestly celibacy. And in 1525, 
a group of Benedictine nuns approached him and said, hey, we want to leave the cloister, but we're kind of being held against our will. Our families want us there. And so Luther arranged for his buddy, who was a fish merchant and who sold fish to the, the nunnery, to smuggle these ladies out in fish barrels in a covered wagon. And in 1525, four nuns, four Benedictine nuns, show up at Luther's house. One of them's name was Katarina von Bora. And he started talking to his friends about maybe getting married, this Katie. And so he talked about it with them a while and sort of mulled it over. And this is in his friend's words. He said, when Luther realized his marriage would please his father, while the Pope, cause the angels to laugh and cause the devils to weep, he decided to marry Katerina. <laughs> and so, uh, so Luther married this lady, and uh, he left that old priest life behind, and uh, she ended up being a, a great helper to him, and it's a really, she's a cool person. You should look her up and read her biography. So Luther says, every Christian, by grace through faith, is righteous and has been set apart to serve the Lord. You don't have to be a nun. You don't have to be a monk. You don't have to be a priest. Everybody has direct access to God because of what Christ has done in exchanging our sin for his righteousness. So serve the Lord with gladness in whatever your hand finds to do. So because of that, doctrine of vocation, the doctrine of the church, the law gospel distinction, and salvation by grace through faith, Luther really starts something that we're going to see play out over the next couple of hundred years that really defines who we are as people. You know, um, I don't wear a priest collar. I don't go by reverend. You know, some of y'all call me Pastor Brad, Brother Brad, whatever. But I'm just a normal person. I don't have any more access to God than you do. That's what it means to be Baptists. We are people who have inherited the great tradition of the Middle Ages, but have recognized that, first and foremost, we submit ourselves to Scripture and live our lives out according to its standards. So because of that, I hope you all saw enough that you'd want to emulate and some convictions to cling to. What sticks out to you about Martin Luther? One of the things I, I love, I didn't put this in here, he says um, when at the end of his life he's thinking back about what God has done through him. He's starting to see the Reformation play out in other places, and, uh, in Switzerland, and people are like, how did this happen? And he says, y'all, the Word of God did the work. While me and Peter sat back and ate sausage and drank Wittenberg beer, God's Word did all the work. And uh, as you know, Luther's a complicated figure, but an amazing person. And so I hope you'll do some deeper research. I think that I put some, uh, oh, I, you know what, I edited this and took off. There's a couple of resources I wanted to point you to. So you gotta, if you've got a pen, write these books down. And there's one thing you can find online for free. The first thing is Martin Luther's book called A Simple Way to Pray. A Simple Way to Pray. You can find it online for free. His barber, one day while he was cutting Martin Luther's hair, he asked him, how should I pray? And so he wrote a little short thing teaching his barber how to pray. And it's still great. It's a scripture-based method of prayer. So look that up. It's really cool. Uh, pretty much the standard biography on Martin Luther is called Here I Stand. I think it's the last, the last name of the author is Blanton, B-L-A-I-N-T-O-N. -N. And you can find, I looked it up today, you can find a copy for like 10 or $12 on Amazon, Here I Stand. And then, uh, y'all know, I, every chance I get, I recommend books by Carl Truman. And he's got a book called Luther on the Christian Life. And he does what I've tried to do tonight, but better. He's, his expertise is in Martin Luther. So... He brings out these theological emphases and what they mean for us today. So there's some things you could read if you were really super interested. All right, well, with all that, I'll turn you loose. Don't forget, we got church this Sunday. we got a baptism to celebrate and uh, senior recognition. If you need a bo baby bottle to help with the ministry, there's a, b a bucket out there. And there are even some leftover cupcakes in the fridge. So if you ate yours and you want another one, take it with you. All right. Yes. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad y'all enjoyed it. Well, you can thank my wife for that. You're welcome. Yeah, come check them out. They're so awesome.